Welcome to the Deep Roots Podcast. My name is John Girton and I am your host and we are so excited to be here in the Spring Arbor Studios with Tom on audio and today we have a very special guest, Carrie Schimmel. Carrie, can you introduce yourself for us? Hi, John. Absolutely. I am uh, Carrie Schimmel. I'm a 2003 alum of Spring Arbor University and I'm currently the CEO of Campbell Ewald. We are a 113-year-old advertising agency. Okay. Wow. 113 years. That's one of those things that when you think advertising, you don't think of 113 years ago, that was still a booming business. It was. I mean, it's it's frankly pretty amazing to see kind of full circle. Back in the day, it was actually all about experiences and mm. trying to get people's attention and getting people to talk about things around the world in an earned media space. And then we yeah. went to television and all sorts of interesting things. And now we're also back to we're trying to get people's attention and experiences. Now yeah. they just get documented in all sorts of ways. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, we're going to jump into some questions here. Love to get to know you more and, and know your story a little bit. So first of all, uh, when we were looking at your your history and even in your email that you sent us, you said that you were raised as a military brat. So wanted to jump into that about yeah. your journey and how that shaped your cultural curiosity. Absolutely. So um, my dad was in the Marine Corps for over 20 years. And he was a pilot. And so growing up, we moved a fair amount that happens. Um, and so one of the things I'd say is I got used to being kind of a new kid in some mm. ways and also maybe having an outsider perspective. And so um, oftentimes when you're moving, sometimes even the middle of a school year, you have to step in and, and really be that moment where you mm -hmm. listen and you explore a culture that may not feel like your own. Yeah. And um and I think that really opened me up to being uh, open to new things, especially when you're going from very different states to state. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. So what inspired you to pursue a career in marketing and design? And how did your time at Spring Arbor influence that path? Um, well, it was accidental. So oh, okay. I would say, um, you know, when I was here at Spring Arbor, I did an art degree and okay. I focused on graphic design. I think back at the time, that was right when... The discipline was being introduced here. Okay. And so um, it was one of those things where I honestly didn't know a lot about advertising uh, with my dad being a pilot. He was mm -hmm. also a pastor actually okay. as well. So we did not have a family full of business mm -hmm. people. I didn't even know who to talk to. And so it was really one of the first jobs that I found mm -hmm. offered a design kind of internship. And I thought, great, I'm going to use what I went to school for. And over time, it just evolved. And I mm -hmm. think my journey has been pretty unique in the fact that while I started out in art and design, and I'll probably always think of myself mm -hmm. as a creative person, I then evolved into strategy and mm -hmm. business and eventually the role that I'm in today. Awesome. I kind of resonate with that because my uh, major here was worship arts. Okay. My dad was a pastor. I went into ministry for 17 years. And now I'm in marketing. And it's kind of one of these, like, as you grow, as you shift, you start to feel like, oh, I'm really good at this thing, or I really mm -hmm. have a passion for this thing. And I think a lot of, it's maybe a lesson for students. You go into school thinking, this is my life. Yeah. But then you graduate and you're like, life is not what I thought it was. And it kind of shifts and turns. And But we still have that foundation, which is so pivotal uh, that we learned here at Spring Arbor. So. All right. In your time at SAU, how did you, as we have our new brand promise, yep, see that? grow deep roots spiritually and academically? Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that is so important, especially in your college years, is if you've grown up in a family that has been deep rooted in the faith, mm -hmm. you have to come to a moment in which that becomes not just about your upbringing, but mm -hmm. it becomes truly a part of who you are. Yeah. And so I would say during college that really the moment of discovery in which it was not just a religion, it really mm -hmm. is a relationship. Mm -hmm. And getting to that point was really pivotal. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it was in part to some of the teachers and the experiences that I had here and mm -hmm. can still remember some of those chapels and uh, the impact that they had. But then I think also academically, um, you know, I mention this sometimes when I've come back is just the role that the core curriculum mm -hmm. played. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really unique perspective in the fact that it helps you understand your role almost in citizenship, your role in faith and how you go and you interact with 
um, really understanding culture and your responsibility and helping to be a light and shape that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that that was also a core part of just my experience. And, and I still go back to some of the books I read then. Mm -hmm. I know the titles now, and I even encourage people to read them at, from time to time just because it really helps ground you in understanding yeah. um, people and, and understanding what our role is in helping to, to impact and, and be present and to listen and to learn. Yeah. I often, when I'm watching, you know, U of M on a Saturday or something and get mad and start to yell at the TV, like, how could you throw that ball? It dawns on me. I'm like, he's 19. Yeah. And how in college people kind of view you as an adult, but you're not really, mm -mm. and you're still trying to figure it out and how pivotal that is to learn those things, to establish who you are spiritually. Um, and I, as a youth pastor for a long time, I would tell my students that all the time. It was like, yeah. you can't live your, your parents' faith. It's got to no. be your own. And Spring Arbor is a place where you can do that in a protected, kind of healthy way. Yeah. And it's, it's really pivotal for a lot of people. It was for me. It was for you. How did your time at SAU set you up for success in the marketing world? In the marketing world? Okay. So I'm going to go back to my good old core 200 again. Okay. Um, you know... It was interesting because I feel that class in particular, my cultural, cross-cultural study and mm -hmm. things like that, the way it approached understanding people mm -hmm. and understanding the systems of society and broke that down in such a way that allowed you to really study and learn and and accept and explore the identities of others. Um I didn't realize that was literally at the core of planning and strategy mm. until I was like, oh, wait, I actually know how to do this. That's mm. interesting. So, you know, I think in some ways it's just fundamental to how you come up with understanding universal insights by really getting to the specific yeah. and and being able to draw that out. Um, and then I think in some ways, you know, it's the foundations of what your the the stories and and the things that people say that stick with you because mm -hmm. especially in this industry it is always evolving yep. so you know i will never look back and be like wow that portfolio still holds up right mm -hmm. it doesn't um but what i do remember are some of the the teachers and the things that they say um yeah. bill bippus was one of those mm -hmm. for me still remember he would just say time and time again i say it now Talent is the willingness to spend the time. Mm. You can have all the potential in the world, but if yep. you don't invest the time to develop that, that's on you. Yeah. And um, and so I think some of those are just those moments where, yes, fundamentally I understood it with core, but I think it's also the people that have just invested in you yeah. that still stay top of mind as people who have been impacted the way that you think and process yeah. and and still those one-liners you pull out from time to time, you know? Right, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Now, I had the the benefit of being in your talk that you just did. Uh, for those of you that don't know, she was invited here as one of our speakers um, and was able to speak to a room full of people and marketing students. Our marketing office was there. Mm -hmm. And I was only able to be there for the first half because I had to come set up for this. But some of the commercials you showed in there speak to what you're talking about. Of They told stories. Yes, my wife and I, uh, now that I've been in video marketing for two years, can sit and watch TV and just sit and be like, why was that made? Why was that commercial <laughs> made? Like, there's yeah. no point to it. But then that one commercial comes on that tells a story, pulls at your heartstrings, and you're like, that made a difference. That makes me want to buy that product. Yeah. You talked a lot about Dove. You talked about uh, Adidas was one of those, that mm -hmm. uh, 321 campaign that they yeah, did. Yeah. So many of those stories. So can you tell me a little bit more about, you talked about core and how learning people's stories matter, how you're able to utilize that in marketing. I know that's not on our list, yeah. but it was fascinating to me to hear that. Well, I think one of the things that you find in in all of great stories and narratives is there has to be that specific tension hmm. that while it might be so unique to that individual, there is still something universally relevant into the way either they navigated it or the way that they felt in that moment. And I think that's at the heart of any great campaign mm -hmm. is being able to really get down to that, that kind of core element there. Um, you know, I, I often will see plenty of things where I'm like, Oh man, I know how hard it is to make great stories. Mm -hmm. um, too often, I think 
we try to go to a space that we think is safe by being very, uh, what I will say, tactical mm -hmm. and how we communicate things. And it's kind of like, well, if I just give them the information, everyone will know. Mm -hmm. People don't remember that way. Yeah. You know, the way in which when you think about history, when you think about the way in which um, stories are passed from generation to generation, narrative storytelling mm -hmm. is at the heart of that. Yep. What's even harder is when you can do that in 15 seconds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think those are the things that uh, I, I really love to dive deep into. Um, I think some of where, you know, how does it apply to maybe what we've learned here and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think it is that moment where you often don't get to those stories unless you know how to build really strong relationships. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, some of the best research I've ever been a part of is where it doesn't come out in the survey and it doesn't come out in the first conversation. It comes out in the third or fourth mm. conversation when you've built a sense of trust and they say, OK, I'm going to be real with you. This is this is the one thing mm -hmm. that really bugs me or this is the thing. And you don't get that with just a superficial mm -hmm. thing. And so I feel like that's also a core part of what you need to be equipped with mm -hmm. is how to actually have meaningful relationships, especially with people that maybe you don't see eye to eye on mm. with everything. Yeah. And so getting to that point is also kind of a critical part of how you actually get to the good story. In addition to that, I'm not going to short sell. I mean, being surrounded by creative mm -hmm. individuals and mm -hmm. giving them the space to go with it for a while knowing that it may not make sense right now but mm -hmm. you'll get there that's the other thing that we we sometimes don't do is we don't give people the space mm -hmm. to make creative things yeah and that has to happen too yeah i chuckle because i'm a creative person and you it's hard for a creative person to paint all of the details in a picture we know the big picture and we know we want to get there but we need other people to surround us with how do you get there yeah and that's kind of how a creative mind works is i see it i don't know how to get there so I, I, I just kind of chuckle at your, your thought there. So you've already talked about Core 200 yeah. a number of times. I'm guessing that's your favorite class from Spring Arbor. You know, it's the one that I would say had the most impact. I don't know that it was my favorite at the time because mm -hmm. it was also the class that in many times made me the most uncomfortable. Okay. And so I think that's kind of telling that, yeah. you know, things that push you outside of your comfort zone are yeah. the things that end up sticking with you. Um Probably some of my most favorite classes. Um, I do love art. And okay. I will say any class that Bill Bip has taught mm -hmm. was one of my favorites. It really That's was. Awesome. That's I great. mean, who he would push you to be great. And sometimes it would be infuriating. Like the time you made me draw off my left hand for an entire week. Oh. But it was something that really taught you. And, um, and it was something to where you just enjoyed the craft. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, again, you had to have that space to be mm -hmm. creative. So... So, yeah. Great. So you've worn many hats throughout your career. What has been the most rewarding aspect of transitioning from designer to creative director and now CEO? Yeah, there's a step in between there, too, okay. which was creative director to strategist, which okay. that was definitely the bigger leap. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the challenges, and this is one of the things in the talk that I just gave, somebody asked the question, if you could tell college students one thing, what would it be? And I, you know, my big thing is just don't put so much pressure on yourself, mm. right? I think one of the biggest challenges in moving from creative even to strategy was that at the time I kept being told, well, you didn't come up through Mm. business school or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. And so it was really difficult sometimes to get that first interview or mm. that first look. And I'm really fortunate the agency I'm at now, I actually started on the creative team and I had voiced, you know, look, I really want to do digital strategy. I think that's my mm. calling. I'd gone back to school. I got a master's in interactive design and game development, but mm. focused most of my effort on the strategy side of that. Mm. And, um, and so they said, "Hey, well, why don't we why don't we give it a go and, mm -hmm. and see how it how it turns out?" And I had gotten the chance in that world to work on Cadillac and mm -hmm. work on the global branding for Cadillac mm -hmm. and what that was. And so I think, you know, for me, it was really that moment. And I've had a lot of these actually in my career, in which I get to a point I don't really know what's next, 
And it's one of these moments in which I just have to be open mm. to to telling myself it may feel really uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but what's the best that could happen? Yeah. Right? And when I do that, oftentimes uh, the opportunity opens up and something new steps in and, and you get an experience that you just couldn't have dreamed of. Yeah. I can tell you this, 10 years ago, when I first walked into Cambly Wild, I never would have thought I'd be their CEO. Mm-hmm. So to just have that opportunity in those paths, it's been pretty, pretty great. Yeah. It was just making me think of a podcast I've been listening to recently about people who transition from ministry to marketplace. Mm-hmm. And there's a woman who used to work for Willow Creek. Okay. And she was talking about how ambition was one of those things that in the ministry world was kind of looked down upon. Mm-hmm. Of be humble, don't put yourself out there. And she said, now that she works for LinkedIn, ambition is something that's praised. And it just made me think of your story of, this is what I'm doing now, but I'd love to do this. And how important ambition can be of yeah. saying, it's okay that I'm putting myself out there. I'm not doing it in a prideful way. This is just what I'm passionate about. And it was just making me think of that, of how sometimes for women in the marketplace specifically, you're told not to have ambition, just kind of go through the, the motions. And she was talking a lot about that, but how now in the marketplace and in advertising and all this different kind of stuff, ambition is a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too. So with my dad being a pastor, mm-hmm. my mom worked at a Christian school. So mm-hmm. I really fundamentally understand this idea of humble yourself. Yeah. Um, but I think to their credit, and I really hope I can be this parent someday too, you know, they really did fuel my sister and I's ambition mm. to strive to what could be. Yeah. And so um, it was interesting because even though sometimes those things that I would set my sight on, I mean, it was pretty impossible. Maybe they'd happen, but mm-hmm. they had all the the encouragement mm-hmm. to really do the work to try hard to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think, though, that sometimes we equate our faith with the level of our sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And honestly, there's nothing there's nothing that would say that that should be the case. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's one of those where it is about humbling yourself, but you can do that in a way that also gives you a really loud microphone to do mm. big and good things. Yeah. And I think too often, especially with women, there is this sense that we will only go for things that we think we are 100% qualified mm. to do. And yet our counterparts might do it if they feel the 20%, mm. right? So I think sometimes there is this need to step into not just ambition, but mm. to step into having a sense of courage mm-hmm. and being willing to try. Yeah. And and I think the other side of that sometimes is that we just don't want to fail. Oh, yeah. And yet success is built on the back of failure. It yeah. really is. So, um so, yeah, I think in the ministry side, though, it's an interesting one because mm-hmm. I think you can lead with a sense of humbleness and kindness that can be unusual mm-hmm. in that space. But honestly, to tamper your ambition might be also tampering your impact. Mm. Great word. And that's awesome. I love that. Teaching advertising at the College for Creative Studies must have been a unique experience. What key lessons did you learn from your students during that time? Oh, I love freshmen. That's what I've learned. Um, You know, I think one of the things that was really great when I was teaching freshmen, they were so excited for what this could be. And I think that they walked into it with open eyes and what it what what can happen Mm -hmm. if you dream big and you push hard and, and that sort of thing. CCS is also was unique in the fact that many of my students uh, were often coming from other schools. Hmm. And so they had kind of gone the route, a lot of them, of more of that traditional college experience. Hmm. And then as they had gotten into it, they realized, you know what, I really want to specialize in something and come over. So there was a maturity that some of them had that I think did help in that lens. The challenge, I'd say, is by the time they got to their senior year, they were like, I don't know if I want to do this thing called mm-hmm. work and advertising and all of that. And I'm like, you got some loans to pay. Yeah. So, um, so I think that was sometimes the the shift. But I I do feel the one piece with the students that really was super helpful 
is so time so many times like academia it is rooted in tradition and legacy mm -hmm. and this is an industry that is constantly evolving mm -hmm. And so being able to have a sense through their eyes of what was authentic and what wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, what was happening on some of these emerging platforms that, you know, brands might not have been engaged with, but these were happening at kind of the subculture mm -hmm. level. That was also really exciting to, to yeah. see firsthand. So I think that's one of the bigger takeaways for me inside of the academic world is to accept the fact that we have to be nimble and agile in order to give people what they need to thrive in the workplace, as well as the foundations that will give them those deep roots, as you say, for a long time. Great. So balancing a high powered career and motherhood is no small feat. How do you manage the challenges of being a mom in the advertising world? Oh, man, uh, I would say there is no balance. <laughs> it is just about looking at things and priority as, mm -hmm. as time goes. Um, but there's also a sense that you know, one of the core things that was really important for me is having an incredible partner mm -hmm. alongside to help me do this. And so uh, I've been married for 22 years. So um, thank you. And he is someone who has stepped into this role with me. And I think that's one of the things we try to support each other and make sure that we know it's we're not just individuals taking things on. We do this as a family. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not easy sometimes. And it's definitely one in which uh, I think proud moments happen, like when when they come to the office and the girls are like, "Yeah, you're a CEO. That's pretty cool, Mom." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, I guess I guess it is." Yeah. Um, but I think it's also one where helping them see that working hard is also something that can be really rewarding as well. Mm -hmm. And so I try to balance all those things, but it is it is truly a village to make all this stuff happen. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. So on, on that same path, what values or lessons do you hope to pass on to your daughters regarding curiosity and creativity? Well, I hope to help my girls really understand um, to be open specifically to understanding different cultures or identities that are not their own. Mm -hmm. um, it's something we've tried to work hard to give them those experiences mm -hmm. and to open that up mm -hmm. and to be really thoughtful and mindful and and also helping them recognize the bias that they're going to have just because everyone comes in with bias, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's one. I think, too, with creativity, um, thankfully, they are two very creative girls mm. in different ways. My youngest is just an incredible storyteller mm. and and comes up with narratives that are just compelling and interesting and imaginative. And my oldest... Um, I mean, she can't go a moment without drawing and really coming mm. through with with different ways to see and and explain things. So I think it's just trying to fuel that and to not tamper it down. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm trying to take a page from my parents a little bit on like, let them go after that. We'll figure out the business part later. Mm -hmm. We don't have to solve all those things now. So mm -hmm. it's just it's it's honestly trying to give myself the pep talk of like, let them be little and mm -hmm. let them have fun with us. Yep. You know. Yep, I resonate with that a lot as a father of three. <laughs> For young professionals looking to enter the marketing field, what advice would you give based on your own experience? Oh, you know, so many. Um, I I think the first is to not be precious about how you get into it. Mm. Because so much is evolving. Sometimes we think we have to get that one exact right role or we have to work for that one brand or that thing. And it's what I would say is like progress over perfection. Just mm. get started. Mm. And um, what's so great about so many of the agencies specifically is that you can get started in one department and learn and expand your skill set, mm. introduce to another and enter that other department. Mm -hmm. I mean, some you need some background and skill set based on the programs and things like that. But I think so often we put so much pressure on ourselves to just know the one right thing. Mm -hmm. And there is no one right thing mm -hmm. on how to enter this. So I think that's that's the first piece. Mm -hmm. um, the second I would really say, though, is to get caught trying. Mm -hmm. Somebody once told me that. Um, uh, and it's an important one because so often... We think, okay, I'm going to do what I'm asked, but do more than what you're asked. Mm. That is a lesson I learned here, actually, mm. uh, which is, you know, if they ask for one, you you do too. Mm. Uh, you, you think about the ways that you can try and explore and bring new ideas in. Yeah. 
So it's great. Can you share a story from your career that particularly highlights a turning point or a lesson learned? Oh, I've got a real good one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's interesting. They say in this career, especially in advertising, if you work long enough, you'll have a situation in which you will be let go. Mm. It is one of the hardest things in this industry because you have to be incredibly resilient mm -hmm. because change happens all the time. Brands change all the time, mm -hmm. all those things. And um, so 10 years in, I, uh, 10 years in, I had a situation in which, oh, it might have been 12, uh, in which I got let go from the agency I was at. And it was interesting because prior to that, I had written up a list of like, 12 things I wanted to do in my career. It was like that turning point to mm -hmm. say a big, bold ambitions. And I sat across from someone prior to that moment and she goes, you don't, you don't think you can do them here. And I'm like, sure, can, you know, plucky optimism. Yeah. But I also wasn't listening to the fact that maybe there needed to be something else. Mm. And when I let, got let go, somebody who was part of it made the comment, I'm doing this because, and he was a person of faith, because I really feel like I've been told by God, this is not where you're meant to be. Mm. And it was devastating in all yeah. the ways that it can be pretty devastating because I found such of my identity in that. Mm -hmm. And so a uh, short time after that, I enter into my role at CE. And, and honestly, it was like two weeks. It was amazing how this turn of events happened. And when I was moving during the pandemic um, and I was in our new office and I was shuffling through papers, I found that list. Mm. I've done all but one thing on that list while I've been at Kimberly Well. That's amazing. And so sometimes we have these moments where we feel the world changes mm -hmm. and it's a moment in time that it just wasn't meant to be. And yeah. I look back on that and I'm like, wow, how, how that time was used mm -hmm. and how the opportunities that were had. And so um, I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, yeah. be open to the pivots mm -hmm. and know that, you know, don't be afraid to make the big goals. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we're open to that and we're ambitious, like you just talked about earlier, yeah. um, a lot of good can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that you're making an impact in, in the marketing and advertising world. But even here at Spring Harbor, what you just did and spoke to these students over in the RCF, <laughs> my niece McKenna is a student here and she texted me right afterwards and she was like, I want to be that. You know, she was like, I want <laughs> oh, that great. job. I want to do that thing. And she's in digital marketing. And so hearing from someone who's, who's been down that path, who is a person of faith, who's been here at Spring Harbor, who knows how this all works and where it is and all that kind of stuff, it matters to these students. And you talk about Bill Bippus and yeah. things like that. I can guarantee you McKenna in five years is going to be like, I remember when Carrie Schimmel said this <laughs> at this thing. I think that's the kind of impact that people yeah. like you can have on our students. So I want to say thank you Absolutely. for giving us your time, for speaking to the students and the staff and faculty that were there, and also being on the podcast. But as we close, I always try to just open up a broad, open-ended question. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience before we close up? Ooh, that's a big question. I know. All right. Um, you know, I think the one thing I would share is, you know, just try. Mm. I feel like so often we get in that moment where we're a little cautious to mm -hmm. jump into that next thing. And, um, and I think that's been the one lesson I've learned is be okay with being uncomfortable, mm. step into the challenge, yep. run into the fire and, you know, allow yourself to be open to what maybe God might have for you. Mm -hmm. Great. There you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So thank you for joining us for this episode and this awesome conversation with Carrie. I want you to continue to join us for future episodes. Make sure you subscribe and share this with people as well as this uh, is a great conversation that really does impact not only just the Spring Arbor community, but those beyond and those who are searching and looking for what it is to be rooted in this world. So thank you so much to Tom and Carrie for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. 